We're going to kick off straight away with Liz Hobden. OK, well, thank you for inviting me along. And I'm, I must admit, my first comment is there are so many of you and there are so many projects. And I'm very impressed by the range of projects. But I also suspect there are more of you um, who are out there who weren't able to attend. I thought I'd start, I've been asked to talk about planning policy and planning applications and I thought I'd start off by talking about the self-build and custom house building register which some of you might know about. Um, just a bit of by way of background, now that's actually managed by another bit of the council so I'm in planning another bit of the council, the housing strategy manager our register and it's such a, a wordy name I'll just call it the register. Um, now the requirements um, to introduce um, a register was introduced in 2015 um, and it required all local authorities to maintain a list of people who had expressed an interest in self-build or custom build. Now following that in 2016 came a duty upon local planning authorities to, and I will read it out so I get it right, give suitable development position, uh, permission in respect of enough service plots of land to meet demand for self-build and custom build housing in the authorities area. So you have those two main strands that help you. Um, now it's very much based on permissions, not actually on the development plan. So that's the requirements. Um, and there are three types of sites you might look for, and I know that you've been involved in the pathway that um, Emma Kumar in our housing strategy team has been working on, which is a pathway to helping you find sites and how you go about doing that. So probably plot, starting off on plots for private developments, one-off plots is second, and then council land. And of course, council land's a, a potential opportunity for you um, in terms of uh, community-led housing. However, you're competing with a lot of other uses and needs in the city, particularly for affordable social housing um, and living wage housing. So the City Council has got a strand of work around direct delivery of affordable housing, which is much more affordable than we get through the private sector. So there is a lot of competition for land in the city. I'm sure you've discovered that in, in your work around your, uh, your projects. I think I also, in terms of managing expectations, once you get on the list, there is no guarantee of actually getting a site via the list. So actively looking for sites yourselves is definitely recommended. Don't rely on the register for finding you a site. Okay, now I was going to give a bit of planning policy background. Um, firstly, I was going to talk about the relationship between Brighton and Hove and the South Downs National Park Authority. And one of you mentioned you've got a site in the countryside, in the Downs somewhere. Uh, Brighton and Hove City Council is only the local planning authority um, within the bit of Brighton and Hove that isn't in the National Park. Once you hit the National Park boundary and go over it, uh, the National Park Authority is the planning authority that you're looking at. And some of you might specifically be, be looking at greenfield sites for your new developments rather than looking to convert existing buildings. So it's important that you know that. In terms of development plans for the city, uh, we have a development plan in place called City Plan Part 1, um, and it took an age to get that plan in place. It took about, um, I like to think it only took four or five years, but it took a lot longer actually. And the biggest problem we having, have had in getting that development plan in place was the constraints we have in terms of, of the needs we need to meet in the city. And the biggest need um, that we struggled to meet was housing. So the government rules told us we had to find housing land to meet all of the needs of the city. So we had to carry out this study um, that told us we needed 30,000 homes to meet needs ac across the city, future needs of the city to 2030. Now we were only able to meet um, less than half of that and the development plan has said that. So we had to go through the ringer to actually demonstrate that we weren't able to identify land for 30,000 new homes. The reason why land is very restricted in the city, really obvious and you know it already, we have the sea to the south and a national park to the north and a very tight boundary um, to the national park. We've got some pockets of land uh, between the national park, open space between the national park and the city boundary, uh, known as urban fringe land, 
and that's the land we had to look at for additional housing, which was um, led to quite difficult decisions for our councillors to make. Some of that land within the urban fringes, parks, open space, so it, was, it was quite a challenge to get the plan through. Not only did we need housing land, we needed um, employment space. We, ne we haven't got enough uh, space for jobs in the city. Uh, student housing is also a big challenge, and you've talked about uh, the student uh, community led housing but we also need purpose-built student housing in the city so there's a lot of challenges there and it's a bit of a pressure cooker in terms of land values which i'm sure you've encountered um, now what does that leave you with in terms of a development plan what you have um, uh, are a number of potential sites you could look at what we have to do as part of uh, preparing a development plan which actually allocates sites or identifies sites for housing which is what you're interested in um, is we have to do a study called um, sorry about uh, the name strategic housing land availability assessment that study sits behind the development plan we call it SHLA for short <coughs> because it's too long to say every time uh, and the SHLA identifies all housing sites of six or more dwellings it lists them all it includes sites that are um, already consented, but it includes all other sites. And I would, first of all, point you to that particular document. It gets reviewed and updated annually. Um, and we have to monitor delivery, so we have to look at those completions the following year. So we're starting that exercise now, completions for the last year. So I would definitely go there first. Now, the sites you might be interested in are the urban fringe sites. They are... There are... Um, we first identified about 39 of those. Now, as we're going forward, some of those might drop out, but um, they're also listed in this document called the Shah. So they're they're a good starting point for you. Sorry, were they online? You, you can go online. Them? So if you go to um, our website, yeah. uh, Planning in the City, which is our development plans, and then go to Background Studies, and you look at, look for Strategic Housing Land Availability Assessments and you'll find that list of sites there. Uh, what you need to do, they are privately owned largely, so that, that would be where I point you to. Sorry, I'm just interrupting you, Liz. No, um, I'm happy. For, uh, the the Schlar, actually, I've got a copy of that if anyone wants it. I mean, actually, we can just send it round um, yeah, on email. Yeah, yeah, we'll just send it round to everyone's company. Um, now, you might be thinking, well, are there any policies in this uh, city plan part one that talk about um, self-build housing um, and community-led housing well uh, the uh, policy the urban fringe policy we ha uh, which is policy <coughs> SA4 special area 4 um, has a section in it that talks about ensuring there are opportunities for community-led housing to meet local housing needs so it, we do recognize the need for this type of housing um, within the urban fringe sites and they are suitable type of, of um, sites for that so we do recognize that it doesn't carry much weight it's in the supporting text of that policy rather than in the wording of the policy what I'd also draw your attention to is um, our affordable housing policy which applies to all dwellings of five or more units so all planning applications that come in for five or more dwellings we would apply our affordable housing policy um, and with that the requirement. So if you go from five to nine, we ask for 20% affordable housing, normally as a payment. Then from 10 to 14, we look for 30% affordable housing. That can be as a payment or as number of units. And as you hit, go over 14, so 15 plus, it's 40% affordable housing. We always apply a viability test on that because a lot of developers struggle to meet that in the current uh, development climate so uh, there are a lot of challenges around build costs at the moment for the development industry so I just wanted to make you aware of that because some of your cooperatives are <coughs> hitting that target already um, and this issue might come up for you um, if, if you successfully come forward with your development proposal um, now that's the main plan that's in place there's another plan we're writing unsurprisingly part two of the city plan we're preparing that at the moment that's the detail policy so the first plan is the strategy the big chunky sites um, part two is the detail sites the housing sites including the allocations for the urban fringe sites 
um, plus detailed policies. Now, uh, we've been preparing that for a while. We're planning to go to our committee in January, asking to go out to consultation on the draft plan. And in that plan, you will see lists of sites and you will see detailed policies. So that'll be something, we're going out to consultation, so that'll be something you probably want to comment on, um, either collectively or as individual people and or groups. And um, we will be kind of doing quite a comprehensive consultation for six weeks in July and August on the development plan. There are policies that talk about um, community-led housing. Um, and one is a general policy about housing quality, choice and mix. And um, that talks about uh, supporting a range of housing uh, choices uh, in the city. So it's a supportive policy if you're coming forward with your proposals. Um, and it's an encouraging policy. It's not, we're not allocating any specific sites for um, self-build or custom build at the moment in the plan. Um, but it, the policy sets standards and encourages um, proposals similar to yours. Um, and again, also in the urban fringe site allocations, we also talk about encouraging provision of land for self and or for custom build service plots on the urban fringe site. So uh, once again, it's an encouraging policy rather than an allocating policy. To give you a sense of scale, there are about um, 800, there's potential for about 800 dwellings on the urban fringe site, these little pockets of land around the periphery of the city. Um, some of the chunkier ones are council owned and um, uh, you know we would be looking to deliver probably directly affordable and living wage housing but some of those are over 100 dwellings so they might not, they probably wouldn't be interested in those, most of you. Um, now other routes are, and I think you're aware of this, is uh, we have a large greenfield site in the north of the city, Total Valley it's called, got a very unusual name. Um, it's about 38, 7 hectares in size, um, a developer's coming forward with an outline application for it, um, probably coming in in June. Um, but there's um, a, guide, a planning guidance document that sits alongside um, the allocation for it in part one of the city plan and that talks about self-build and custom build and officers have been encouraging the developer to set aside some sites for that purpose um, in their development plan, uh, in their development proposals for the site. That's a bit of the background around the development plan. I was just going to mention um, planning applications, what do you need to do? Um, so. Um, of course you need to, um, there's a lot of work, I mean Ian could probably help a lot more than me as an agent and Nicola probably covered. on the, <laughs> you're covered, I don't need to talk about it too much. You need to submit a planning application for development. I won't go into too much detail because um, Ian will want to talk about that. But with that you need various, I, I would probably recommend some expertise to assist you with that. And I, I noticed as we went around the room, some of you mentioned that you have that expertise. It definitely get um, support probably from a planning agent or planning experts if you're putting in a planning application and or generate those skills I mean I don't see why we can't assist you with developing some of those skills um, but it's about getting the right drawings ready your proposals ready any supporting documents and Ian will talk about the kind of stuff you need to submit with your planning application um, and I've mentioned the pathway which is how um, we will help find sites if there are sites available uh, in terms of council owned, uh, owned sites and of course they probably would be more affordable. Um, there is one site that's coming forward as a pilot at the moment, you, you probably know about it on Plumpton Road, is it bun Bunkers, okay. House, yeah. Bunker Housing Co-op? So that's underway and that might be a useful example for you in terms of looking at the you know good practice and, and how that works. When uh, you mentioned the kind yeah. of support that you can offer? Yes. Yeah. Can you give us an idea of what that might look like? Well, I mean, maybe we could um, get a, one or two of our development management officers um, to, to have, have a workshop with you and talk to you about how we deal with planning applications, how we consider proposals or something like that. I'm sure we'd be happy happy to do that and give you some advice yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, Can we speak with you about that, Liz? No, I'll, I'll speak with Liz and we can sort yeah. something yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, and in terms, I was just going to mention permitted development rights, but again, Ian's going to talk about that, but that's another avenue. And per permitted development rights just means that you can go to one use to another use without needing planning permission, um, to, to residential use without needing planning permission. And the government has been um, increasing re increasingly relaxing uh, planning rules to allow more residential development to come forward. That's a big uh, priority for the government and for previous governments. Um, and Ian will talk about that a bit later. Um, but that was it. I was going to let you ask any questions you might have. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, is there any way in which the council, and I appreciate the um, financial difficulties that the council are in, but is there any way in which the council can uh, work with developers to not only request that they consider one or two areas mm. that they're developing for community land trust, but actually to negotiate with them mm. an assurance that, well, both affordable housing will be offered, genuinely affordable mm. housing, and also would there be possibility for the council to ensure that the developer also provides space for community land trust, the type of development? It's something we're working on. Uh, we're not requiring it, and I don't think we're able to require it, but what we're doing is we are encouraging developers down that road, and the policies in the uh, emerging city plan part two are definitely encouraging that. And you've got encouragement in part one, around, particularly around these pockets of sites around the urban fringe. So you are getting um, some encouragement um, with developers, and we're particularly doing that with Tosol Valley at the moment which I would expect would generate a bit more housing. We're, we're looking at over 800 new homes going in that area. It's a mixed-use site, but it's quite large, and uh, we are pressing developers on that. But if a developer isn't supportive, then it is, it's quite difficult in terms of getting the leverage and in insisting upon that. You, you talked about the urban fringe sites, and then you said some of them were that the council were building the uh, affordable housing as mm. well. Mm. How do we know which ones are which, like which ones are available, and which ones the council are going to use? I mean, what you could do is um, uh, make inquiries about them. I think as a council, we can be very clear which ones we own, so we can make that available to uh, the Community Land Trust and be really clear which ones those are. The big ones are uh, that we own are around White Walk and Coldine Lane um, and we're bringing forward a joint venture with Hyde Housing to deliver uh, living wage housing on those two sites. Um, they're going to be for, uh, the first of a number of sites that we, we as a city council will be delivering housing on. The others, um, there, are, there aren't many proposals in terms of um, council sites on any of the other remaining sites on the urban fringe that are owned by the council. But we can make the list available of, of the sites we do own. So, so would, a, would a group, a community-led housing group, be competing against the developer then for those remaining sites? I mean, I, allocated for housing? Uh, I don't think that would, we, we do have, I'm, I'm, bench, I'm straying a little bit out of my, okay. my territory, but I would say that uh, we do have to achieve best value on our land when we sell it. Uh, and that's one of the requirements of, um, I think, probably national legislation. However, we do have to deliver our priorities. This is one of our priorities, but um, I'm afraid it competes with other ones. And an acute need is affordable housing in the city. Now, the pathway helps provide you with guidance on that. And um, that actually indicates how we will look at the different needs in terms of council land and how uh, the, the pathway you will have to getting potential sites. Okay. Okay. It's worth me explaining, we, we um, got a copy of the draft it's pathway very recently um, this week, yeah. so we haven't shared it with people because we only had it on um, Monday. So, uh, so it, and we've had a meeting with the council this week to understand it and understand exactly how it will work, so we will be able to share that once we've got really clear about exactly how it will work in practice for um, groups and where we fit in, but it does set out. Nicola will communicate something about that along the way. Okay. I know that the um, South Bell Bridge is 
saying that they want to build their own houses and, yeah. and that there's, there was a, a, a statutory obligation to, to Yes. I, I didn't quite pick up what kind of how the council needs to respond to that. Yeah, it's um, it's actual name, and I think it came. F yeah, it's called the Self Building Custom House Building Register. Um, the duty is that we hold the register in terms of, uh, as a local authority, and the next duty is as a planning authority. We have to give suitable development permission in respect of enough serviced plots. Um, of land to meet demand for self-built and custom-built housing. So we have to try and give consents to meet the demand. And at the moment we have um, uh, 74 individuals and nine groups on the register. Um, and the total number of plots being sought is 118. Um, the problem we have, and it goes part of the problem, it goes back to that issue of a very constrained city and a, and a bit of a pressure cooker for different uses. Uh, sometimes we're not, as a city, able to meet all of our needs and requirements. And I mentioned three uses, and another particular um, problem we're having in terms of uh, identifying sites is safe for gypsy and traveller sites. So there are so many different types of needs we have to meet in the city that we will endeavour to meet but um, it, it will be challenging but we are supporting you and we want to support you with identifying sites but um, you know you are you are in a challenging situation with the cost of land in the city because of the com competing uses in the city. I don't know about that, and I would recommend to get a colleague in from our estates team to talk about that, so I don't get too involved in that side of thing. But I think maybe a session on the pathway probably would help you around that type of getting clarity on how that will work. And we can, um, we've learned from Bunker, Bunker self build Housing Co-op have been through, uh, been a pilot for setting up this pathway, in some ways the pathway is written because we've been through that process with Bunker, so we can talk about what costs Bunker had to pay, like they pay for a two, three bedroom site in Plumpton Road, they'll be paying a ground rent of £500 a year um, per year for the site, um, but it is contingent on the, um, the members, of who, the people who live in the houses being in housing need as defined by the council, so meeting the eligibility criteria of the council's housing register under a certain level of income, don't own any property, those sorts of things. Okay, I think that's it. Just one thing it would be good yep. to say is, um, we talked about um, the bigger plots not being of interest to groups like here, but I mean, part of what we're realizing through working with groups is that we've probably got demand for about 200 units <laughs> overall from all the groups that we have registered so um, not saying we'd all want to need the same thing on the same plot but but it, there is a critical mass there that means there that be it would be an awful lot easier for some of the groups to 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 join and be working in parallel um, on one site because it saves costs around in lots of little individual absolutely absolutely applications and individual kind of so it's, yeah. yeah it's not that everyone wants to be in this group and it's all no. units, it's, really, it's actually would be great if there was a site where all the community led housing projects could be. Could. So, on, um, on developments of between 5 and 14 units, there's an affordable housing, housing requirement which is uh, acceptable as a sum of money rather than on site housing. So, yeah. I was wondering how you would quantify what that sum would be because that's what would be quite a significant yeah. cost as uh, you know, an affordable cost for. Or, or if you had members in your group who met the criteria or who were on the, or the, on the housing register, but it's to, a lot of it's to do with nomination rights on the part of the, the, the city council. But um, if you look at the policy, it says we require 20% affordable housing on 5 to 9, 30% on 10 to 14, and accompanying that um, is another document and it actually gives you a calculator on, on the sums by units that you need um, sums of money and it's not on the cost of delivering those housing units it's on the policy cost of not delivering them on your site so it, it equates to say on a one or two bed dwelling it's around £190,000 per dwelling it's, you know 
So we calculate 20%, so it's one unit, so that would be 195,000 that would go into a pot and help to directly deliver affordable housing elsewhere. But yeah, yeah have to think about. Like. Yeah, I mean, it might be something worth thinking about. So, um, my second question, yeah. which is, um, under what circumstances would one of the community groups qualify as a registered provider? Registered provider being the housing association that normally provides the affordable housing on the earth. Yeah. Um, I think you probably have to be properly registered as uh, so. How registered providers are what we all used to know as housing associations. So you probably have to be registered. I think maybe some co-ops might uh, be equivalent to a registered provider. So uh, again, it's probably housing. Uh, you probably need to get housing advice on that to talk about the status of your particular group. You might know that. Yeah, too. we've just yeah as part of that meeting that um, that Andrea mentioned that we had with the council this week. That was one of the pathways. Um, was section 106. Uh, sorry, it's a, a affordable housing contribution, um, potentially as an alternative. So the CLT or groups could become an alternative to a registered provider. So that's one of the, the routes we're looking at with the council. Um, it's not in any way sort of formed yet, but that's something we're talking about at the moment. What, what we find is uh, registered providers, the big, uh, and they're big, get bigger and bigger at the moment. So the, the housing associations, as were, say, Hyde, for example, are so big, they're not interested in anything probably less than 20 units. So the the the, uh, the amounts of housing, affordable housing we're delivering through planning permissions is not something really most registered providers want anymore because it's expensive to manage and having lots of little small pockets of affordable housing around the city. And that's probably why we're talking about that as a potential pathway for you and to become a registered provider. So it's a good idea. I've got one more question, sorry. <laughs> um, is there any chance of Hyde on some of the larger sites provide that making you know, provisions for some community lit housing on part of that, those sites. Because they've obviously got a, a lion's share and off, off the sites. <coughs> the sites. Yeah, there is there are small numbers of very big registered providers, aren't there? And they they are they're behaving more and more like private developers because that's the road they've been pushed down. I would say approach them and see how you get on and you might want well, to do it through your group. The high, you know, the council's JV sites. Oh, okay. You know, would, would uh, Hyatt consider providing a number of units, you know, like I said, on Tide's whole valley? It's very much a joint vehicle, and it's a, it's separate from Hyde and the City Council. It's it's a, actually a, 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 a joint venture that is delivering the housing. Again, that's something that you might want to approach. Mm. I can yeah. tell Nicholas knows about this well, already. Yeah. Only j just that we are in com communication with Hyde. Um, so... We haven't got that far yet, but it, we are in communication with them about that, exactly that as well. Yeah. Helen was first, actually. Can I just ask you to clarify? So, I think what you said was that if you're a developer, you have to go the section 106 route, but if you're a registered provider, you don't. Is this for affordable housing? Yeah. The rule applies the same for everyone. So it's about the scale of your the size of your development. Um, you have a choice. We generally are looking for direct affordable housing delivery on site on anything of 15 dwellings or more. Less than 15, you have an option of a commuted sum, which is this payment I've just talked about, or um, with the, the medium ones, which is 10 to 14, you can deliver directly on site, or or make a commuted sum. With the smaller ones, we expect a commuted sum. All a commuted sum is that all it means is you have to pay an amount of money for affordable housing to, for it to be delivered off site rather than on your housing development site. So, as a council, what we're doing is, um, and I'm not an expert on this, but we are looking through our estates and looking at better use of land within the council estates to try and uh, intensify the use of some land. And uh, I think we've probably over the last three years delivered around 200 affordable living wage homes directly by filling in pockets and spaces within council and state. That's the money used from the development. I don't think we've actually used that at the moment. We use um, the HRA account, so income generated from council rates has been used. We're about to use that to get loans to directly deliver. Oh, yeah. Just the part two of the city planning include um, the area 
empty patches, or is it just about that? Because I mean, my sense is that there's mm. empty patches. There are, yeah. City. So does it, does it include those? No, not really, but we do have a separate bit of the council, I think in housing, again, that has an empty properties register, that's in the pathway as well, and that could be something you could be directed to. So, um, but that, yeah, a, a city, the city plan will generally look at that. What we tend to do is, in planning, things come forward through developments, and we set a framework of rules against which we assess those planning applications. So, the register that you spoke about, the self-building custom house building register, includes empty properties. It well. just is people. No. It's people no. and groups. Okay. So you sign up to that if you are a group okay. that wants right. yeah. yeah. self-build or custom-build housing. Right. And I, yeah, I should have probably explained that better. I, I thought you were yeah, have a, had a clearer picture. Just to talk about the empty properties, because we talked to Emma Kumar, who's the officer dealing with this, is also the property for empty, um, yeah, the officer for empty properties. And there's a register of all the empty properties in Brighton, but they can't, it can't be shared. The council app can't share it apparently because of data protection. So what they will do is forward. We've we've got a standard letter that we've been we've given to the council that they now this pathway's emerged. The hope is that they're going to action that and take this letter and forward it to all the people on the empty property register. But all we're doing is saying, would you like to sell your property to us? And not doing anything more dramatic than that. Um, and that's all that offers us. That empty property register doesn't really offer us very much else. There's no kind of compunction. There's nothing. You know, they're empty, some of them are empty for all sorts of reasons. I mean, I mean, Emma's good at sharing her knowledge of why they're empty, which is not always reasons you think. You know, but. Uh, not a lot of promise in it except to ask me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just to belabor that point a little bit, um, I was wondering um, if um, with the relaxation of the change of use laws that you mentioned yeah. and the empty properties thing, I mean is there, um, is there is, I, I have this vague sense that the council owns sort of office buildings and warehouse units and things like that that might not qualify as housing. Yeah. Um, but which could be refurbished or um, changed to be housing units, and is that is that something that we can identify with I, the council? I mean, I, I would say that we do own a lot of property for a council. Um, I suspect the empty properties register is just empty uh, residential properties. I'm not sure how many um, non-residential properties we own or employment properties, but it might be something worth. Um, pursuing or thinking about. How would we do that though? I'd go through our estates team. There's an asset register. An asset register. Yeah, yeah. and we have so to publish that, so that's on the website, yeah, isn't it? it? Is, yeah. So you can zoom in and, yeah. and look at properties, but you might not know whether they're empty or not, but you might see an empty asset. one and think, that's I right. will yeah. look at that. Look what I'd. I've got, I'm, I can send that round as well, actually. I mean, what I'd say, because Ian is going to talk to you about PD right, permitted development rights, what I would say is that we. Um, as a city also needs to ensure, right, to avoid becoming a dormitory, a uh, residential dormitory city, we do need jobs here, employment space. Um, and we have suffered quite a lot recently with loss of office space. Um, in the centre of the city we've got an, uh, um, a protection for offices, so people always have to apply for permission still. Uh, but in the outer reaches of the city you can uh, change the use onto permitted development, but we still just a, just a, you know, a plea really is we just still need office space and employment space in the city for jobs. In reference to the asset registers, there's <coughs> the potential to have like mixed use sites if you, you know, to keep some of it. Yeah, absolutely. And then some yeah, I mean, a way we're very encouraging of mixed use development and we have a lot of mixed use type development sites in the city already. And often what we do is we use the, uh, we encourage developers to use the value that you get from the high value uses like residential to help pay to refurbish and do up the, the office bit or employment space which is often a lot um, lower value so it's, it's you kind of um, it enables that improvement of that employment space another couple of questions and then i think we'll have to move on no? that's okay okay Great. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Without further ado, Ian Coomer from Absolute Town Planning. Thank you very much. Brilliant to be announced that I'm the speaker just before you have a tea and coffee break. <laughs> it's a brilliant, brilliant slot to have. Um, I'm here really to talk about the planning process. You've heard from Liz of Brighton Lake City Council around the development plan. 
Um, I'll perhaps try and fill in some of the detail uh, as a planning practitioner. So today I will be talking really briefly around my background because you do need to decide what weight to attach to the advice I'm giving you today. Um, planning applications and the information requirements and the journey from finding your site to getting your consent and having a, a, a fantastic party at the end of the process. Uh, the ability to engage and problem solve prior to submitting your application. Uh, Liz touched on this, it's the preparation before you go into a planning application process. Uh, niche applications on sites that otherwise might be protected in the planning process. Permitted development opportunities and the ever-changing amendments to this. Uh, how you can uh, be helped to set off on your own planning journey and then some questions at the end. So first of all, my background as a planning practitioner. Um, I've been a town planner since 1985 and qualified as an RTPI member in 1993. Um, Liz quite rightly emphasised the need for you to get specialist advice throughout the process um, when you're dealing with planning. Um, the key thing to look out for is whichever planning consultant you choose to use to, to try to make sure that they're RTPI registered because you've got a certain quality assurance that goes with that badge. Um, I have 22 years of town hall experience and over 10 years experience in the private sector so I've had most of my career on the receiving end of planning applications dealing with them but the last 10 years I've been helping people, a vast different type of client as well as market housing providers in obtaining a planning permission. Uh, so I've experienced both sides of the public-private divide. I've never actually worked with a community land trust so I'm hoping to learn as much from you guys today as, as uh, you might learn from me. I've often handled really controversial applications with some considerable public interest. <coughs> and my experience extends from urban, rural, urban fringe, uh, different planning authorities and practices. So I'm very experienced in dealing with the balance between the public interest and local harm. Currently operating across Surrey, Sussex and London, so although I'm based in Brighton, uh, I work across the, with the wider region and regularly deal with up to 50 different planning authorities. And, more importantly, live in Brighton and feel passionately about the city. So on to planning applications and the information requirements and, and the journey. These are key sources of information I've flagged with you, um, and I'm sure you could probably create some links to make them available for people. Over the period of the last 10 years or so, an awful lot of the information around planning has, has, has been sought to be slightly demystified. Um, I mean, you will have heard Liz mention the strategic housing land and availability assessment, schlars, and it's like any profession. It has its lingo. Um, but there are lots of websites out there that will descramble some of that complexity for you. And I would flag in particular the planning portal, which is a very useful source of information for you. Um, and also the Royal Town Planning Institute that I referred to earlier. They have some very good, um, reasonable explanations of, of how planning operates. Brighton and Hove Planning Register, I mean, the, the City Council's website, though it's vast, because obviously it doesn't just deal with planning, absolutely vast website, it does have some very good um, information on there uh, by way of planning. In particular, the planning register, because what you can do is to locate sites that are perhaps already in the planning process and you can watch them progress through to getting a planning approval and even watch the webcast of the debate at planning committee, if, if you so desire. Um, and also, touched on earlier, the South Downs National Park Planning Authority are also applicable as soon as you get outside the, the boundary of Brighton Home. So the information sources are more freely available now than they've ever been before. In fact, probably be overwhelmed by the information that you can access. When it comes to planning applications and the requirements and the journey, first of looking at the process, we've talked here during Liz, Liz's presentation and towards the end of that around you finding your sites. Um, and then, of course, you need to establish what the odds are of you getting planning permission. And that's, that's the point at which you're going to need to start to get some professional assistance. There's a pre-application process. So if you have a piece of land and you have some, uh, you, you've formed 
um, some kind of association with the landowner and you want to move forward with detailed proposals. The City Council also have a pre-application process so you can go to a meeting with the Council uh, and get some feedback on some preliminary sketch proposals that you have. And in fact, in some respects, the earlier the pre-application process is, um, the, the more benefit you'll get from it because it, it will ideally identify sites that have got legs and work progressing or sites that you should perhaps dismiss early on. Um, community consultation, presuming you have some reasonable feedback from the pre-application process that it's a scheme worth progressing. Community consultation is always good to talk, I shall cover that. Um, in getting the team of specialists on board, as well as preparing the application, and then around the decision making process. So the information requirements, um, this is the real bread and butter stuff, you've got your site, you're preparing your planning application, you've had your, your, your pre-meet with the council and they've given it a tacit thumbs up and you start to prepare for uh, lodging. There are national requirements to be aware of. Um, it, it, you wouldn't be able to just lodge a planning application with a few sketch proposals, you have to have properly drawn scale plans, ideally by an architect or some, someone that really knows what they're doing with, with, with plans. Um, when it comes to local requirements, as well as forms and plans, you could have to produce, uh, this is a, a fairly comprehensive list, your sites won't necessarily need to produce all of these reports. And I've listed these to give you some kind of idea as to the amount of work that's involved in submitting a planning application. You may have to accompany your proposal with a heritage statement if you're in a conservation area or listed building or a particularly sensitive location. Affordable housing statements, biodiversity checklists, sustainability checklists, technical details, tree surveys, design statements, lighting schemes, transport assessments, noise assessments, tall buildings and so on. <coughs> the main reason I've listed these is that most of your sites are going to perhaps require a handful of reports. But these are the types of requirements that the planning authority will expect from you in order to be able to properly evaluate what you're proposing. So you've done all your groundwork, you've produced your background reports and the planning application is with the planning authority. I've come up with a series of visuals really just to try and explain to you, to, to you the kind of considerations that Liz and her team will look at when they're considering your application. So a local photo there, mods and rockers on Brighton Seafront, that's there to depict transport. Um, so you will need to uh, address you know, what will the parking standards be required, how accessible is your site to public transport. All of those things are material planning considerations. Badges of course, wildlife, ecology, particularly if you're looking at an urban fringe site that's more likely to be even more prevalent. Although having said that, having accompanied surveyors on things like bat surveys before, um, you, know, you, you would be surprised at the ecology that is even um, around on quite urban sites. Things like you know, if you're proposing a tall building, and increasingly I think because Liz touched on the constraints of Brighton and Hove with the sea and the downs, increasingly schemes are coming forward for slightly taller buildings, and the council do have a tall buildings strategy. Of course, bats and ecology. This, uh, you're not, there's no way you're going to read that from the back, it occurs to me now, but this is a, a poster on a project that I dealt with for a new care home in Purley a few years ago. And you would think, wouldn't you, a proposal for a new care home would be broadly supported by the community. This is a poster uh, referring to Nightmare on Higher Drive in Purley, um, which prompted 500 objectors to a care home. Um, I simply put it there for you to be aware that as you come forward with schemes, you may think that what you're proposing is not all that controversial, but be, you'd be surprised. So have one eye on that. Um, and also things like renewables and, and the whole kind of green agenda around dealing with planning applications is relevant. Tree surveys, you may well need tree surveys, and it could be not just the size of the tree, but the roots of the tree that go outside of the tree crown that mean that some of your site is sterilised from development without the loss of a tree. i put that up there. That's actually a, a, a shading from a, a, a tower in, uh, in, in America, but 
always be aware when you're looking at schemes if they're one, two, three, four stories, whatever, they will cast a shadow. They may have an impact on the amenity of a neighbouring site. So it wouldn't be unsurprising perhaps sometimes that planning authorities ask for a shading study or, or, or some kind of technical report to demonstrate that there's no negative impact on neighbouring amenity of, of, of next door. Of course flooding, flood risk assessments, they've become much more prevalent in recent years uh, and in fact some of the planning authorities I work with routinely require flood risk assessment on sites that are perhaps at relatively low risk of flooding. So it's good to talk. And I can't emphasise enough the, the need for you as you bring forward science to make sure that immediately adjoining neighbours and uses understand what you're doing, have discussions with them, um, you know, not just the planning authority. Uh, here are some of the consequences of people that have launched into planning applications without perhaps bringing the local community next to these sites along with them. And an awful, and an awful lot of um, housing proposals in recent years, particularly given the, the, the homes agenda and the lack of affordable homes, has even been fronted by occasional celebrity um, speakers. Niche applications, what I'd, what I'd like to talk to you about, and it's on the agenda for me to speak to you about this, is this is um, what's called Para 55. It, it's taken from the National Planning Policy Framework. And it really relates to promotion of sustainable development, but where it becomes more interesting for you, where you're looking at urban fringe sites and perhaps sites that are not within a development area boundary. And this is where it becomes slightly more controversial because they're not sites ordinarily that would get planning consent. This policy, Para 55, recognises around the rural economy, but towards the end, um, it will allow development in except for exceptional quality and innovative nature the design of a dwelling such as a design should be truly outstanding, innovative, helping raise the standards of design more generally in rural areas and reflect the highest standards of architecture, significantly enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. Now, there's been an increasing amount of Para 55 houses, um, but what they are not about is a standard Barrett's home in the countryside. They are the complete opposite end of the spectrum of that. So Para 55, in shorthand, it means the special circumstances, circumstances set out in the bullet points within Para 55 that allows new isolated homes to be built in the countryside subject to certain requirements. And I've posted a few examples, I mean this is certainly not a Barrett's box, uh, a few examples of Para 55 housing and one that I think they will be aware of there. Um, so that's a project of yours. Yeah, um, that, that one on the lower left is yeah. one of mine. So you, can, so you can see from that they are, they are they're slightly different to your average housing project. <laughs> is that it a swimming pool? Yeah, it's, it's a natural pool. Yeah. It's no chlorine. Of that development? Roughly. About three million. Wow. <laughs> Between two and three. It's the kind of thing you see um, is it Kevin McLeod um, talking about very late on a, on an early evening um, TV programme. So you, know, you, you do find these schemes that do come forward. Um, they really do need to be truly outstanding and innovative. They need to raise the standards of design. And they need to reflect the highest standards of architecture. <laughs> uh, enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. Can I just jump in there? Yep. It, it's, it's, it, it's important to recognise that it's a really high test. So, you know, we had a barrister to argue that stuff and it's big money, yeah. I mean, I reckon the, uh, the applicant there spent probably a hundred grand to get planning. So it's not an easy <coughs> thing to do. And so it took six years. Could it ever be cheap? Could it ever be affordable? That paraffin. It's, it's a really good question. And it's something that I did a little paper on, actually, because I think it's a really interesting thing to take out of that sort of really rich person's realm and, and make paragraph 55 really, truly affordable. And I think there are ways to do it, um, but I've never seen one that's got permission yet. So I, I don't know. 
Yeah. It's a really interesting thing, though. That and I'm you circulate your paper? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm doing some work with developers going through a pair of 55 at the moment down in um, East Sussex. And it, it's not a forward wing sense of we yeah. want to be considered the forward wing and make a cheap, cheap to run rent. But it's, uh, the land was very, very cheap. Right. It was agricultural land. Yeah. And um, I think it was done with water tower or something. And um, it's looking fairly likely that, that, you know, and actually using a, a fairly, when I say standard, town planner, you know, regular rather than barristers and all mm. the rest of it. Yeah. He's, looks like he's succeeding. But the other thing right. I wanted to ask, though, is my understanding is that these Power 55 developments, it tends to be one for one dwelling. It's one so isolated it dwelling. Like a or three or four houses. That's or it, exactly. <coughs> it's an isolated <coughs> dwelling, yeah. That's right. I, no, it's, it's simply being mentioned, really, because of the specifics of Brighton and Hove uh, and th those pockets of land that are not within the development area boundary and therefore there's not a necessarily a presumption in favour of development um, but they, they are um, increasingly beginning to come forward. I mean it would be interesting actually to see a much lower cost scheme that still met those tests yeah. because you know you can be innovative and not expensive. Yeah. Um, so it would be interesting, and look, if, if any of you want to try and progress the Farrah 55 project, by all means do let me know. Peter, um, there, there is just one more thing on that. Um, there is another part of paragraph 55 which is about having um, a, a business and living on the site because you need to live there because of the business. And actually a guy from Barkham Nurseries got a paragraph 55 through just on that. Um, so he, he had to live there, he argued, because if anything went wrong with his systems and whatever of watering and things like that, you know, um, then he had to be there on site to live there and he managed to get quite an affordable house. I think he had a budget of something like 250000 to build this house. Um, that was a few years ago, but um, you know, that's another one to look at, that it's a bit more easy and uh, cheap, obviously, to, to get yeah. than the exceptional design yeah. one. I mean, the, the, that's true, I mean, this is the first bullet point under under Power 55. What I would only add to that, though, is that very often if you're progressing an argument for a dwelling on the basis of an agricultural worker, it, it will become exclusively an agricultural worker's dwelling, mm. a, effectively a farmhouse. And could it include shared housing? Um, like a dwelling, but that it was shared? I don't know, actually. Possibly. It, it, it could, there's no reason why it necessarily couldn't. Um, I, I think you would need to demonstrate the, the size of house to accommodate that volume of people are all needed, uh, that size of property to, to um, service the need of that particular agricul agricultural worker. Um, so I, I don't see any reason, I mean you would be looking still at one dwelling. Mm. But it, um, it could be shared, I don't, could see, be shared. I don't see why it couldn't be. I think I think where it becomes more sensitive is that the larger the dwelling, the more impact it has on the um, character of what is still countryside that is to be protected. So I, I think the only issue potentially with size is might, might be the visual impact of the, of the larger dwelling. So could the, could the collective landlord the co-housing or cooperative group itself be the agricultural worker? In, th in theory, I don't see any reason why not. Yeah, because that would solve that problem. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Just say that again, Helen. If the, because a, a society limited is a legal person, um, and so if, we, if that legal person can be considered the agricultural worker, mm -hmm. then all the people in it mm. are kind of like, you know, arms and legs of that other body that, which is considered to be the agricultural mm. the worker. Very often when those sorts of, I mean it's been quite some time since I've, I've done a, a farmhouse basically, an agricultural worker's dwelling, but it, typically the sorts of organisations that would really heavily advise on that are ADAS, the Agricultural Development Advisory Service, it, it becomes a little bit specialist in terms of agricultural occupancy, but there's no reason why, um, you know, if, if that dwelling, that single dwelling is needed um, for the purposes of farming, um, then the argument would stand whether that's you know, one farmer or several. Is there any crossover at all with the low impact development laws? They're completely separate, then, is it? Because that's connecting 
uh, people that are living on land, very strict I think, environmental um, assessments. Of course, PPG 7, I think that's changed as oh. national. Well, um, PPG 7 was paragraph 55. It's become paragraph 55, it's become isn't paragraph it? 55. <coughs> what, 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 yeah. are, what I'm desperately trying to avoid is to go too much into the sort of the technical details around it because PPG7, you're quite right, what you're referring to was, was specific to a particular type of development, but, but in recent years all of those plethora of documents have, have all been compiled into a singular national planning policy framework. So if you read the national planning policy framework but you're familiar with PPG7, you, you will get to the odd paragraph that you think that seems a bit familiar, uh, that's why. Um, and currently revisions to the MPPF are out to consultation, um, so the, the consultation responses are, are due around May. So in terms of precedent, which is obviously extremely important in planning, there's uh, communities which have successfully got planning with the PPG 7 when it was that, so is that filtering through this paragraph? For example, we have East Land and Devon and 14, um, planning commission, 14 dwellings, under the development law, um, and there's a few others around. So, would that is that a national precedent? The, the, well, the, the, the national planning policy framework applies nationally, um, and all and individual councils. I mean, you heard Liz talk about the development plan earlier. The development plan is is written within the context of, of the national planning policy framework. Individual councils can't go off and do something that's contra completely contrary to, to that framework. Okay. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd need to I'd need to look yeah. at that in, in more depth. It's not it's not a particular type of application I've had that much experience in, to be honest. But it, my consultancy is a generalist consultancy, mm -hmm. so I, I get involved in all types of different applications. And then if we move on to permitted development, what I thought or what I was asked to do today is to talk about some of the types of development that doesn't need what you appreciate as a conventional planning application. Um, the rules, they keep changing. Um, the Town and Country Planning General Development, General Committee Development Order is the key document um, for you to take a look at. Again, you remember me talking about the links earlier around the planning portal and RTPI. There will be um, fairly non-technical uh, analysis and explanation of, of some of these more detailed, legalistic um, bits and pieces of, of, of uh, information I'm going to give you. Within the what's referred to as the GPDO, or you may hear some people refer to it as just GDO, uh, Part M refers to a change of use from shopping to housing. Part N refers of a change of use from amusement arcade to casino and housing, to, to housing. Part O refers to a change of use from offices to housing. And in Brighton and Hove, um, Liz referred earlier to the protection of a, a kind of a central office district. Um, to use a bit of jargon, that's called an Article 4 direction. What it does is the blanket of uses that the GPDO allows for can be taken away by different authorities for different types of classes of development. And in Brighton and Hove, in recognition of the need to retain a central office area, and accommodate a multiplicity of different land uses, not just housing. Um, the office to housing um, freedom is taken away in Central Brighton, but um, you know, there's, I'm aware of a lot of relatively successful conversions that have happened to vacant office stock that was perhaps built in the 50s, 60s, um, in, in Port Slade, in Hangleton, and some of the, the, the more peripheral um, parts of Brighton and Hove. That freedom still exists. And then part P, change of use from warehousing to residential, and part Q, change of use from an agricultural building to housing. Uh, and that's quite an interesting um, dynamic because, I mean, there are certain limitations to this, um, and that's up to 450 square metres. Now, all of the above, although they don't need planning permission, um, they do need uh, for you to lodge an application to effectively agree with the council that they don't need planning permission. Um, which I shall come to. So this is an example of a project that I did in, in Croydon, um, which was not only an office to housing conversion, um, but also an extension to the offices to create another 40 odd units of, of housing. So that's a 160 unit scheme. Um, but 
the income that was generated from that turned around a really ugly, brutalist 1950s office block into what should be a really good residential um, uh, development. The affordable housing, I mean, we, we were referring earlier to uh, affordable housing only being provided by RPs. In this particular case, this is a, an entirely private rented sector housing project, but the affordable housing the council require is being provided by the same managing agents. So it's not being provided by an RP, it's being provided by um, the same people that are managing the rest of the market block. Did they have to get approved to do that, like a registration? What we've, what, what we've done is, as part of the, the... I was just asking if they had to get approved to be a provider. No, as part of the national planning policy framework as it currently stands, in the annexes, and I think this really comes from the London plan, the, the government sort of take, increasingly taking the view that affordable housing, if it's affordable housing, can be provided by anyone. Um, and in that particular case, there is no registered provider. There is a, what's called a Section 106 planning obligation, so it's a legal document that accompanies the planning consent. And that means that the appropriate proportion of affordable housing within the block has to be provided. The council have a certain amount of uh, nomination rights, but that was negotiated between that and the, between the council and the provider. And the beauty of this particular project is that there's not, you know, it's not floor five or floor six that's affordable. It's, it's anywhere within the block side by side with, with market housing. So that's that's probably the largest office to housing committed development project that I've done. Um, Sorry, yep. I just wanted a question about that. So how did the council assure that the affordable will stay affordable ongoing? As a plan, as Section 106 planning obligation. Just, um, just, just monitor it, as yeah. it were. And, and, and what happens is the rent has to be um, uh, reviewed annually, and it can only be, uh, and the rent can only be up has to, has to be no more than 80% of the market rent. And uh, one of the problems is, I mean, this is London, and of course there's always the controversy, well, is 80% of the market rent really affordable? Yeah. Uh, which I, I, yeah. I, to I totally endorse. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I think the, increasingly, I think because of the shortfall in the provision of actual affordable housing, central government and planning authorities are looking at more imaginative ways of delivering affordable housing, mm -hmm. genuinely affordable housing. Um, rather than just exclusively relying on registered providers who, in my experience, increasingly are acting more like private developers, yeah. frankly. Was the brutalist aspect of the building a factor, like a material consideration? Like, is that, does that help if you're going to fix a, a light? It, 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 it can help, um, particularly if you're looking at buildings that have perhaps been run down over some time. Uh, I mean, this has been in office use since it was first built. Um, in, in Croydon and, and looking really tired. Also the location of this particular block, I don't know if any of you know Croydon, but the northern part of the railway station with the new footbridge, visitors to Croydon would get off the footbridge and the first building they would see was this ugly building. So the council attached a lot of weight to, to what was actually being proposed. Um, this is an example of the uh, agricultural um, conversion to housing. It, it tends to, at the moment, within the changes to the GPDO, uh, relate to relatively small um, units. And as I mentioned, all of these require what's called prior approval. Um, I, I do need to explain this a little bit more, because at, at the one hand you've got things that don't need planning permission, so this afternoon you can go and do, in theory. Uh, at the other extreme you've got things that we know do need planning permission, you need to submit a planning application. What you do with the prior approval process is the particular part of the law that means that you don't need planning permission. You assert that with the planning authority, you fill in form still, and you need to address that. So you may, may need to address things such as uh, contamination, maybe transport, uh, and then the planning authority within a certain amount of time come back to you and say, yes, that is permitted development, you can get on with it, or they deny you that permitted development right. So without getting into a lot of detail around it, that, that's the process. So there's planning permission, not planning permission, and prior approval in, in between those two. And then finally, on how to get help, I mentioned before the City Council website, the South Downs National Park, the RTPI, and of course myself. Um, I should say that as a local Brighton Road resident, I've 
been a freelance planning consultant since September of last year, but within the private sector for 10 years. If any of you want to call me um, with, with, for any advice, even if it's only for me to point you in the direction of a source of information to read separately, I'm quite happy to do that with, without a fee. Um, if we then start to, if I then start to get more involved, we will need to discuss fees. Um, but I want to emphasise again, so long as you're appointing a Royal Town Planning Institute qualified town planner, um, then, then that's fine, you don't have to use me. Okay, thank you. Generally, uh, the community land trust seems to have a lot more to do with Brighton and Hove, the city. Um, we know that the National Park looks after planning for the areas around. Is it possible to say simply what's the biggest difference between a conventional local authority and uh, a national park when it comes to planning? Well, the national park's huge, yeah. absolutely huge, um, and the national park uh, has a slightly different a slightly different remit in some respects. Obviously, the, the, it's all about the national park. It's about public access to it, uh, and so on and so forth. That there's not necessarily an expectation that the national park, for example, will de deliver huge amounts of new housing because it's a national park. Um, so it's a slightly different objective. Um, I went along to the very first National Park Planning Authority Planning Committee, which was quite an event in, in Lewis, as it happens. Um, I was proposing a new sports centre next to Lansing College, um, the, the cathedral, the Gothic yeah. thing there. It's quite, quite a sensitive one. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting because they do, at that planning committee, there was that scheme for a new sports centre and a planning application for a dormer window, which was only a planning committee because it was a dormer window belonging to a member of staff of the South Downs National Park Planning Authority, <laughs> um, which was quite a bizarre <coughs> scenario. But um, very often, uh, an awful lot of the roles and responsibility when it comes to planning of the National Park Planning Authority are delegated back to the, the local planning authority. So uh, there's a kind of a check-in process <coughs> that, that a lot of the work within the National Park is probably dealt with by the planning authority within which it sits. Um, but the more strategic stuff is a kind of referral on process. Um, so it's quite, it is slightly complicated. Um, but they are a, a different set of politicians um, made up from you know, the constituent uh, local authority areas across the National Park. Sorry, um, sorry. Uh, you did mention, well, it's probably for Liz, I suppose, actually, you did mention community infrastructure levy. Um, so, is there something you can tell people about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, also, um, do I understand you have the business development uh, rights for office to residential particular? Is there's no affordable housing requirement required? <laughs> so, has that changed? Or that, no, that's, that's, that's true. Yours was a bit, you was to the extension, was it? Yeah, it, because of the extra six floors yeah. of extension, it was affordable housing on that proportion. But because it was part of the wider block, it could be delivered anywhere within the block, not just within the extension. Um, on community, there's a, there is a, it's been around for some time now, community infrastructure levy. Uh, and, and what that means is, um, I mean, I've been dealing with it for a lot of the London boroughs for getting on for 10 years. Um, what that means is, Unlike with planning applications and a, and a planning obligation that goes with it to maybe fund some transport improvements or to fund education improvements or whatever, um, councils will come up with a, a levy per square metre of build um, to put into the kind of community. I mean, it sounds more and more like a monopoly to kind of put into the community chest, so to speak, um, and to uh, fund some of that education infrastructure, medical infrastructure, and so on. Um, what that means is that. Planning authorities have got, that have got that arrangement in place, you know, depending on how many square metres your building is, what your tax liability will be. Um, and that goes after the body. It should, in time, reduce the need for separate legal agreements to stand side by side with planning commissions. That's what it should do. 
um, but in practice it's not really quite working. Would it apply to any of the products of the size? Well, I don't think it's actually here yet for Brighton & Hove. No. Um, right. it's, it's still being developed. For so the community infrastructure? Yeah, the yeah, the sill, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Still at the moment, the preliminary charge is as a headline figure that the most expensive per square metre figure for Brighton & Hove is £175 per square metre at the moment. Um, they're, they're some way off adopting it. I, I think it's probably a good year or so away. So it's yeah. a one-off it's, it's a fee at the point you commence development, not in order to get the planning permission, because the community infrastructure um, that your development is creating um, will only apply at the point where it's being built. So it's not on getting planning permission, but on getting planning permission, you will be completing uh, what's called a, a SIL liability um, notice. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very taxation um, type process, frankly. And, and, and bizarrely, I dealt with a, a new community use in Croydon, I and mean, this is the irony of it sometimes, the way it plays out, a new community use that because it wasn't a registered charity had to pay community infrastructure levy to get planning permission for the community use they wanted to introduce <laughs> to the point where it didn't make it viable. Wow. So, it's, 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 it's a very... Um, I mean, most, most developers always don't mind too much because it's at least you know what it is per square metre you're going to be paying. Whereas when you're entering to, into negotiations over a planning consent with the planning authority, you don't quite know what, what other section 106 and planning obligation requirements are going to be annexed to that. So, so in some respects, it's a good thing insofar as you know your costs are from. Can I just add to that, that um, self-build, I think I'm right saying, self-build is exempt. It's exempt, yeah. So if, if you're building your own house, or um, a series of, it's exempt, Still is ex you're exempt from SIL. Um, just one of the things that was said um, is that Mario Wolf, who came down and talked to us about self-build, said that m pretty much all the schemes that we're talking about would be considered to be self-build or custom-build if yes. they're building new. So yeah. they could be exempt from SIL. So they could actually be deemed, yes. so community-led housing by its very nature could be considered yeah. exempt then, actually could we could be. argue yes. that. I, interesting. I would suggest that if you're, good, if you're in the process of uh, and you could build within a year, then probably it's a good idea to do that um, <laughs> before it comes in. But um, it, but even not. so, it might not be actually um, you know added to. So when, 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 when it does come in, the council have got that new income stream yeah. and a certain amount of freedom as to where that's spent that's on it. enabling other development. Oh, well. so it might be beneficiaries of it. Yeah, maybe. Or they, or, they might be, or they might be more militant about collecting it because okay. austerity. I'm going to um, open it up to anyone who hasn't asked a question so far and hasn't got in in time and wants to ask a question. Is there anyone very quiet who wants to ask a question? Go on there, Maggie. No one burning. And well, I'll ask my colleagues to interrupt or add anything. But thinking about the. Um, affordability issue. Um, we are currently in the very embryonic stages of uh, a group of older people looking to uh, combine together to have our own units but also crucially to have shared living space. Now a lot of it is to do with how we um, bond together in a create a cooperative uh, sort of community um, and we all uh, have assets in which to put into to building this or to renovate in the property. So if we, have been, if we are remain below 10, which is what we're thinking of at the moment, we're retaining a sort of a smaller community atmosphere, um, would we still be, by that sort of structure, uh, required to uh, take um, the affordability of the people from the um, council waiting list. Because a big part of it, as I say, is building our community together rather than just providing housing units. The planning authority's first question would be how many units? It yeah. would be more than five and there'll be an affordable housing requirement. Yeah. I think it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, I mean, they would be open to arguments as to why you felt they should set that policy aside, um, and that they're there for you to, to make, really. 
and it's worth learning from the bunker experience. Yes. Even though bunker is about 100% affordable housing, so it's for people who are all eligible on the roof register, and they're building their own homes, and so it's 100% affordable. And what they've negotiated is 50-50 nominations with the council. In effect, what nominations from the council means is that um, the community still has a right to say this person isn't appropriate for the community. So uh, I think we've talked about this some, you know, we haven't put it into practice yet, we haven't seen Bunker put it into practice, but the, the truth is that the council will put forward people from the Home Move Register, mm -hmm. they'll come forward, but if you're running as a housing co-op or as a co-housing community, you'll have some rules about what people have to do to live in that community. Mm -hmm. And those rules, that person coming forward has to comply and be part of those rules. If they don't fit that, like any co-op, you know, and they don't fit your, co your ethos or your values, they don't sign up to the rules, then you can say no. And the council completely accept that. So there, it is subtler than it sounds. We're not just talking about people just arriving on your doorstep off the home move register. It is a negotiation and it is a, a and there may well be people who come off the home move register who are perfectly, you know, good yeah. members of your community. It's yeah. really important yeah. to yeah. bear that in mind. I mean, yes. most of the people in Bunker were on the housing register. Yeah. They got taken off it as the council tightened its criteria in December 2016, but, but they're actually all meet the eligibility criteria we'll send you round. Yeah. And those eligibility criteria aren't that, I mean, for, to, to qualify for a three bedroom house, you have to be earning as a household less than 60,000 pounds. So it's quite a high threshold. It's not like people are, you have to be destitute, you know, kind of, or whatever. It's, it's, it's worth spending a little time understanding what it means and not feeling like it's a simple black and white thing, it really isn't. It's, uh... Can I ask, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Earlier there was one or two of you when you introduced yourselves that were referring to wanting to do housing but with a community use of, of some kind. Um, that's really interesting because stepping outside of the housing agenda the council have got a very robust policy to try and retain community uses and very often community use or former community use buildings come onto the market and they're vacant uh, and developers primarily want to buy them to demolish them build housing <laughs> but the developers have to demonstrate that there is no local need for a community use so if any of you that are looking at to do a mixed scheme with a community use plus housing have found a vacant community use um, then it could well be that that would be more favourable to the council than the complete loss of the community use and exclusively housing. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> good example. <laughs> I mean, that's, it is very interesting because that is nearly all, nearly every group that we have mm -hmm. want, um, well, especially the larger ones, want some connection with the local community. They're not going to communities, they are communities mm -hmm. that want to open up and have facilities that the community could also sure. use as well as the community could mm -hmm. use. And most groups actually want something like that, so it's really good. We should, we must be cognizant that we can reinforce that and mm. make that part of people's explicit vision and values, and find a bit of policy mm. where it says yeah. that, and tie those bits of policy together in our business it, cases. Do we know what that bit of policy is? I think it, I, I, I couldn't give you the reference name, but it, 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 typically the council it. require um, uh, the owner of a, of a, of a <laughs> former community use building of some kind to perhaps market it for a year or so prior to the acknowledging the loss of the community use, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so any buildings that are currently marketed that have a vacated community use would be pretty, I mean, you wouldn't get the freedoms of not needing planning permission. You would need a planning permission, but you, you're off to a good start. Can I just say, uh, we're, we're sort of beyond time now, um, and even though it's really interesting, um, the coffee and tea has arrived. So, um, and I don't know, maybe Ian, you can be available yeah. um, during tea and coffee as well, so if there's any more questions. But we're going to break for 15 minutes, um, so if you can be ready to start again at about 10 past, that'd be great. Thank you. And can we thank Ian as well? We've got the last presenter now, who is Anthony Probert from Bioregional. Uh, thanks, Nicola. So I've got the task of um, putting in a room together at four o'clock <laughs> on the first sunny Friday <laughs> in about six months. But I'm going to be very quick. Um, and what I'm what I'm here to do today 
is to uh, talk you through the development process, essentially. Um, the process of taking an idea um, and delivering a scheme. And it's, uh, obviously there's lots and lots of steps within, uh, within that. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour. And I'm going to frame this through our OPAL project. Um, OPAL stands for One Planet Affordable Living. So what we, this was a project that we were doing with the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust and uh, an architectural design cooperative, I think they're called, um, called Transition by Design, who are based out of Oxford. And what we were trying to do is triangulate um, how community groups can develop sustainable and affordable houses, put those three things together, and how by regional as an organisation can help them do so. So the structure of my talk, first of all I'm going to introduce us by regional and um, One Planet Affordable Living. Secondly, a, a whistle-stop tour of the development process for community housing groups. And then uh, lastly, I'm just going to have a quick what happens when um, uh, discussion. If you haven't heard of Bioregional, we are a, a sustainability charity established in 1994. Um, we work in three areas. Uh, we work in uh, sustainability of the built environment, which is the uh, area of the business that I work in. We work around uh, corporate social responsibility. We work with quite with some of the, the biggest corporates in the in, in the UK and in Europe around their sustainability plans, their monitoring the KPIs, etc. And then we work around policy and governance as well, influencing policy at a, at a national level and also at an international level. Um, we've pr produced sustainability plans for over 100 projects around the world. Um, we also have a development arm called Bioregional Homes, um, which. Uh, it's basically practicing what we preach. So we help organisations, developers, and, uh, and other teams build their own homes. But then we have to show that we can do it ourselves as well to sort of lead in that area. Um, and we describe ourselves as entrepreneurial and practical. Um, if, there's, if there's a challenge around sustainability, we'll try and find a way to overcome that challenge. This is Bedshead. So this is probably the project that we're best known for. Um, this was a project that we delivered, it was completed in 2002 with the, the Peabody Trust. Um, and what inspired us to build this project um, was uh, this um, ideology, basically that we're over consuming in the West. So we wanted to build some homes that would allow people to live sustainable lifestyles and reduce their consumption or change their consumption and uh, reduce their ecological foot footprint, bringing it into more, uh, to, to a more sustainable level. Um, and out of Bedzed came uh, the One Planet Living Framework, which is a set of ten principles of sustainability that we think if you, if you develop a strategy under each of these principles, bring them all together, then you'll have an inherently sustainable project. So um, we have, uh, there's, well, there's a network of uh, 11 One Planet communities around the world that have um, embedded these, these, uh, these principles to such a degree that we believe they're a collection of the greenest developments uh, in, in the world. And these range from, there's a couple of really small projects. Uh, there's one in Australia, I think about 24 homes, um, and another in Seattle, which is about slightly bigger, 40 homes. And then we have um, Sonoma Mountain Village, which is 1,800 homes, and uh, a scheme in Ottawa, which is 2,500. So what I mean by that is that these principles can be applied uh, to development across all sizes. And this is the definition of One Planet Living, is people living happy, happy, healthy, affordable lifestyles within the environmental limits of the planet. So, what we wanted to do with the Opal project is, uh, you remember <coughs> I said that we were entrepreneurial? Well, we found a challenge. We thought, we looked around, we thought there's lots of community housing groups all across the country, but there's far fewer community housing schemes. And we wanted to understand why this is. And um, what we sort of understood is how great the challenge is. Um, how difficult it is to bring a group of people together, have an idea, and then see that de developed into a, a finished scheme. It's a real challenge. So we felt our job was to try and simplify that challenge. Um, so uh, One Planet Affordable Living, uh, we set up to help groups build sustainably, build affordably, play a lead role in, uh, in the development of their community ensure security of tenure, whatever that might be, deliver at scale, you know, make it replicable, and finally earn equity, again, regardless of, uh, of tenure. So even if you're renting, there's a model that um, once you leave a community, you're still able to take some, some, uh, some cash with you. So on to the uh, 
the development process. So this is the REBA plan of work. And this is the accepted UK model for the design and construction process. So I'm going to take you through it very, very quickly. Um, it's eight stages, rather confusingly starting at stage zero. Um, so stage zero is a strategic uh, definition, and this is where a developer will create a business case for his project and uh, a development brief. Moving on to um, preparation and brief, here he might have an idea of a piece of land where he might be doing his development. Um, he'll set some project objectives around quality, around outcomes, around sustainability. Um, he'll likely have a budget at this stage, and like I say, he'll have identified or secured a site on which to build his project. Anthony, sorry, just to interrupt again, does everyone know what the RIBA is? No. Oh, I'm very sorry. Okay, so, so it's the Royal Institution of British Architects. Um, the developer, they, will uh, put together a project team around uh, the concept design stage, which is REBA stage two. And uh, that's when they will start master planning and outline design. They'll have some preliminary cost information. And like I say, they'll, they'll put together their, their core team of architects, engineers, um, environmental consultants, most likely. Moving on to developed design, REBA stage three. This is when their master planning uh, is evolving into actual buildings. There'll be some structural design of the buildings, some building services. Uh, the project is starting to come to life. And it's around REBA stage three that the developer will, uh, will likely submit for planning. The fourth stage, technical design, is when you're detailing uh, the details of the building, uh, likely to be layouts, specialist subcontractor designs, and specifications. Um, predominantly that's done usually after planning, once planning has been uh, achieved, especially on larger schemes, and then you go back and again you fill in the details. It's probably quite expensive to um, do two, three and four all in one, then submit for planning and get turned out. <laughs> uh, the last few stages, five, six and seven, probably don't need too much talk, uh, talking about. Construction says what it, what it is, uh, handover and close out, and then of course in use, which is probably the most important bit for the people in the room. Um, so the benefits of using the REBA plan of work uh, for community housing groups is that it's understood by the sector. It means that you can talk their language if you understand this. Uh, it's often used to structure development programs. Um, however, it's quite technical and jargony and um, we found it wasn't really that useful for community groups starting out on their journey to, to uh, think of their project in these terms. So what we've tried to do uh, is simplify this into four stages of development. Um, first of all, vision, moving on into plan, into build, and then finally into live. Um, and what I'm going to do very quickly is suggest things that community groups can be doing under each of these, um, each of these phases of development um, in order to progress their scheme. So under the vision phase, this covers the first two um, REBA stages, strategic definition and preparation uh, and brief. Um, the first thing is really important, you, you guys are probably, you know this already, but it's really important for um, the people in the group to unite, unite around a, uh, an agreed vision, um, some agreed principles of your, of your project. Um, and set objectives that you want your project to meet as well. Um, it's really, really important to ha have good organisation in your group and understand what it is you've got at your disposal and what it is that you need. Um, so at the group organisation stage, we um, recommend doing some, a skills audit. Um, you might have someone who's great at communications in your group, you might have someone who's great at design, um, you might even have a planner, that would be great. Um, but then there will also be some gaps that you'll, you'll need to look to plug. And here, numbers, uh, let's see, um, I've put stakeholder engagement and it's really, really important. There's going to be loads of people, loads of organisations that can either help you or, or can hinder you on your, on your journey. And it's really important to understand who they are, how to contact them and when to contact them. These will be, this could be landowners, it's likely to be the local planning authority, could be organisations in the city that can, uh, that can help you um, uh, deliver your, your project. I've put fundraise at the bottom here. Um, I've actually got fundraise under each, each uh, well, the first three at least, stages. That's not necessarily the case. I think probably at the vision stage you are going to need a little bit of money for incorporation, perhaps for some legal fees, etc. It's quite, probably, probably quite easy to, to lay your hands on that um, initially. Very small <coughs> amount of cash to, to, to start you on your, on your project. So our plan phase um, covers uh, REBA stages two, three and four. 
And the first thing to do is put together a development brief. Um, we recommend structuring that round One Planet Living, but we would. Um, so at the vision stage, you've developed an internal vision, something that you want to achieve that is agreed by, by everyone in your group. What you want to do is then externalise that and make it ready for um, consumption by others and understanding by others. Can I just ask you how to get hold of the One Planet Living brief? You know, what, how would you get access to see? What that is. Yeah, so we have, as part of Opal, we've put together a, a lot of tools and resources. Um, so we have, I think, a tool for a development brief, for um, site appraisal. We have a guide to, uh, on being a good client. This comes to my next... Um, so, sorry, to answer your question, get in touch with me. Um, we put together a guide on how to be a good client because it's really important for anyone for, to be set, taken seriously that you speak the language of um, the people that you're looking to uh, to engage with, and that will be all sorts of professionals and consultants and things like that. Um, this is where you need to plug your gaps. So you know you've got someone in your team who's good at com communications, but you haven't got an engineer. Say it's likely that you'll have to procure one as part of your core core team. Um, and this is where we get to. Um, Perhaps uh, I'm not going to say it's controversial, but it's it's the it's the the part of this process which is probably assumed to be the most tough, and that's land identification and appraisal. Um, there are many routes around this, and I think it's something that was discussed at a previous workshop. Um, but it's very important to have a, a, a site appraisal um, worksheet, Excel sheet, or something that you can used to, to put in your numbers, work out whether this is an affordable uh, site for you, what you might need to do, especially around build costs, etc. Um, and then again, that feeds then into a business plan. So you're going to, your business plan will include things around affordability and tenure, and will bring together um, probably all of this uh, into a, a functional plan that you're able to say, this is how we're going to deliver our scheme. Fundraise at the bottom, again, different ways of, of raising money. Uh, from my experience, the most difficult bit of money to, to find is the bit between incorporation and before you start building. Once you've got planning, you'll find loads of people are going to come out and, um, and offer you money because there's less risk. But prior to planning, and you're going to need a bit of cash, uh, depending on the route you go down, you're going to need some cash to put together a planning application. That's probably the hardest uh, source, of, source of funding. I'm sure there's been a workshop done on that as well. So. Um, not about funding, but, the, the, but the, yes, the uh the grants program can help with that as well. Brilliant. Um, the build phase. This is an interesting phase. Um, when we were doing the uh, the Opal project with uh, with Joseph Roundtree and um, Transition by Design, um, we worked with a group in Bristol called Your uh, called Tiny House in York uh, called Your Space, and then um, uh, the St Anne's Regeneration Trust. And when we were looking at what the build phase might um, might uh, incorporate for uh, a community housing group. It's probably the quietest time. You've done all, you've done your job basically. If you've done your job right, then you know the build build phase should be fairly simple, depending again on the route you go down. Um, but it's quite important at this stage to establish your community governance, how you're going to collaborate around this community, and what you want to um, achieve going forward, um, and to revise and update your plans. Uh, you know nothing's ever perfect. There might be some compromises or negotiations you have to make. And it's important that that's reflected at the build phase into the live phase. Coming to live, um, you've, you've got there, congratulations. Um, you might think that the work stops there, it doesn't. Um, it's really, you know, your community is going to be evolving. You're going to have people coming and, and going, and you have to make sure that, that uh, the community is responding to those people's needs. And then lastly, I've got down here, communicate. It's really important, if we're going to change the culture of the, of, of, of the development sector, um, if we're going to help fix this housing crisis, it's so important to talk about what you've done and help others to, to do it themselves. So, um, yeah, communicate. Um, so that was very, very, very quickly a bit of an idea about the development process and, and, and you know, the big ticket items, I guess, of uh, what you're going to need to do to get there. But what I want to uh, discuss now is the fact that, um, yeah, of course there's some what we call linear dependencies within the uh, within development process. There's going to be some things that naturally come 
um, after one activity will come after another activity. For example, you can't live in your houses until they've been signed off by building control and approved by building control. You can't submit a planning application before you draw something on paper. But then there are all, all, also going to be things that can happen sort of at any time, depending on the journey that you go, go down as a, as a housing group. And I'm just going to take you through three very quick examples of, of a route for different housing, um, different housing groups. Um, so this is perhaps more of a, an independent route. This is where the group has incorporated around a shared need. Um, they've run a share offer and so uh, raised some finance. They've identified a site, they've purchased it. You know, the dream really. <laughs> um, then going through the sort of more uh, linear dependencies, so then they've, um, uh, they've put together a planning application, a concept design, achieved it, um, gone on to detailed design, appointed a contractor, and then right at the very end of this route, they've um, legally uh, formalised their group into uh, a tenant management cooperative. Now that could have been done right at the beginning, but it's quite a good idea sometimes, um, depending on what your group wants to achieve, to leave the formal legal incorporation towards the end because then that allows you to take advantage of opportunities as they, uh, as they arise. So in this example, the site comes first. It might be a farmer or um, a, a parish that has a site that they want to uh, donate or, or sell to, uh, to a group. And so around that site, a group forms, um, again, going through the sort of more uh, linear, linear dependent uh, route. But in this case, they've um, then struck up a partnership with the Housing Association who has taken on the responsibility for delivery of the scheme. And then in uh, this final um, example, this is where uh, a developer has taken all the risk. A group has incorporated, they've uh, formed a partnership with a, with a developer, perhaps paid them, to, paid them to some deposit in order to um, secure some units. But in terms of um, securing the land, actually having ownership of the land, or lease of the land, that doesn't occur until right at the very end. So it would be the, the developer's responsibility to, to obtain the land uh, on behalf of the uh, community group and then um, develop it out into, uh, into, uh, into properties, more than likely with the community group's uh, support. So again, there's different ways of approaching this, different routes that community groups will go down. There's not one set route that, uh, that groups will adopt. Um, and it will all depend on what you want to achieve, the opportunities that, uh, that you come across. And I just want to end really emphasising this. Um, uh, I understand that the majority of groups in this room are probably at the early stages of their, uh, their project. Um, and so just going back to the visioning process really, um, we split it into three, uh, three um, bits of work. There's building the purpose, it's understanding the vision, uh, your skills and your capital base. Then there's building the group, um, putting your group into working teams depending on strengths and capacity um, and having roles and responsibilities within that group to sort of professionalise. And then lastly there's building the message, it's, it's understanding who can help you um, on your way to delivering your scheme um, and how and when they should be uh, contacted. So. Um, yeah, that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour. I hope it was useful. Um, be really happy to, to speak to people more about their, uh, their projects. So uh, our One Planet Affordable Living project, if you're interested in the background and the research, this is the website. Uh, by regionals website is here, and then that's, um, that's my email address. I've also got some uh, handouts to give you a bit more information about uh, One Planet Living and One Planet Affordable Living in particular. And if you'd like to... Um, talk to me about it at any point, I'd be very happy to, to help you. Thanks. Any questions? Are there any questions for Anthony? Is it more dangerous to, you know, to not dangerous, the wrong way, but is, is it more disadvantageous to, to let the developer buy the land because at the end he might not want to sell it to you? Or, you know, just it depends on the developer. There's good and bad developers out there. Um, I like to think that we're a good developer. Um, we, uh, we're, we're doing a community-led scheme in, in Surrey at the moment, um, where we're sort of, it's a bit back to front, um, we're having to manufacture and, not manufacture, mobilise I guess and engage the community and saying look we're offering you this really, um, which is a bit of a challenge actually. Um, 
It doesn't have to be. I think it's, it's, it's really, like I said earlier, it's really important to speak their language. If, if you go in and say, hi, we're, we're a community group, you know, do you want to talk to us? And you, you, don't, you can't talk about the reader stages or you can't, um, you don't understand, you know, the, the, the process you need to go through or the um, types of advice that you're going to need to get and the consultants and the um, other organisations that you're going to need to liaise with. It's really important to, un to speak that language. And then a developer and a planning authority will uh, take you seriously. So I'll, don't get into bed with a developer just like that. It's really important to, to, do, your, to do your work um, and understand who the developer is and what, what is motivating them as well. Um, but of course, if there's, a, if there's a contract that's signed, that's watertight, that's probably where the legal advice comes in handy, then um, shouldn't be that risky. <laughs> Hello. Hello, so we're finding that there's a challenge, the challenging period is having the money up front to buy the land and start the project before you can then draw down from your lender. So that's a massive amount of money. Yeah. You've got equity, you've got this, you've got like this, that's the stumbling block currently. So is, is engaging with the developer potentially something where you could um, almost get involved to lend us their financial support as well as professional support? Yeah, that's right. So, um, like I said, by re if you're talking about my organisation, by regional act on two um, fronts. So we, we 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 support almost through sort of a conventional consultancy, but remember we are a charity. Um, and then for projects that I guess meet our criteria of sustainable, uh, affordable, of some sort of scale, um, we would look at uh, financing and delivering on behalf of a of a community group. Yeah. Like we're doing in Surrey. Do you, do you have a little scale? Project Global just have a little scale, minimum say five hundred. When to, for for the advice that we give through Opal, um, no, there's no minimum scale. If we were to get involved as a developer, um, there's probably a minimum scale of about twenty or twenty-five homes. Yeah, but I mean we're again, although we're a charity, we we we're, we're fairly sizable. We've got about thirty or thirty-five people work for bi-regional. You'll probably find developers who, you know, that are, that are smaller and got smaller overheads and are perhaps sort of more flexible, um, who might be able to, to take on projects that are smaller. It's definitely worth talking to, to, to builders and, and local developers around this, around this area. They'll be plugged into land deals as well that, that might never come to market. Would you ever approach a landowner and say, um, look, if we can get planning permission, will you be whoever it is, and get planning permission on this plot, then we will pay you X amount? Would you ever take it that route? I mean, you'd have to tie it down very tightly legally to stop being meant to make money. Yeah, so that's taking an option on a site. Um, so if you're able to, you basically say, um, subject to planning, we will purchase this site. Yeah. Um, and you agree the fee, and then you as a developer or whoever else would take the risk to put together a planning application. Um, and then, if that planning application is successful, you would you would buy the site. Yeah. Does that happen often? Yeah, taking an option is is very common. Right. Okay. That way, you know you've got planning permission before you buy the site. <coughs> That's right, and you and you secure it. You stump up for a site without necessarily knowing that you're going to be able to build it. Yeah, don't do that. Don't. Yeah. yeah. It's, okay. Getting an option is much better than um, you know. The, or the, okay. I say, the, the benefit. It's all about risk, isn't it? If, yeah. if you wanted to buy a piece of land outright without knowing the likelihood of, or having a bit of an idea about what planning might be, um, how, how easy it might be to get, the land will be cheaper because you're taking the risk. Mm. Whereas if you buy it on an option subject to planning, then the price of the land will be um, uh, valued at that with planning permission yeah. that you agree at the beginning. Um, it's, yeah. So, I mean, you could take a punt, but it's probably, it's good to get planning advice, probably Ian might be able to help you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Okay, great, thank you. But take, take a lead, if anyone wants our support with uh, One Planet Affordable Living, then see me or take a lead. Is it right if I leave these up there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, okay. The one awkward big money question about developers, of course, is um, the standard for most developers that they, charge, they expect to see a 20% profit coming out. They're expecting to achieve that, otherwise they don't get the money to lend to them. So does Opal have a different approach to that, or is it a standard approach? 
sense. You know, the, 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 the primary function of the Opal project was to um, develop a, an affordable model or tool that would help, um, that would help homes be affordable at the end of the project. And what we found is that unless someone gives a concession with the current, um, with, with how development works at the moment, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to achieve. So you could, if you found a piece of land that was a, a reduced um, rate and you took a risk on it because it wasn't subject to planning, um, you know, you could make your scheme much more affordable. If you work with a, a developer, say it was a charity, um, who might not want so, so big a return, Again, that, that, that could help. But there's, and also the, the approach to tenure. So we, we were examining something called mutual home ownership. I don't know if anyone's come across yeah. that. Um, Lilac in Leeds, that was what their project was, uh, was, was based around. And we thought that that might be the answer, actually, um, because then everyone, uh, it, it would require some people to pay, basically people can pay, pay what they afford. And so the definition of affordability obviously isn't standard, it's not common, is what people can afford. So there might be people in a community that are overpaying, but still able to afford what they're paying to the cost of the site. And then there'd be people who are bringing less money or had uh, smaller incomes who were paying the same proportion, say 33%, but actually in real terms, what they were giving was less. Um, and so we thought this could be the answer. Um, having investigated EMOS for the last 18 months, it's, a very, it's very challenging legally. Um, it's quite difficult to get support from um, from banks, although Troidos and the Ecology Building Society do understand it, um, and uh, it's it, it will it probably will take a long time before it, it's mainstream. So we can help you perhaps with MOS if that's something that's, that you're interested in. But it's it is a challenge. It's a real challenge. Just li just listening to the stories from Lilac, wow, so what, how they managed to get that project you know delivered is just amazing. So. Um, you got to do your We just, we, it was the, the property cost of land and property is so much more expensive locally. You'd actually only be able to have quite wealthy people yeah. in your communities if you were going to keep um, the cost to 35% of income. And it just, I mean, we, we haven't given up on it yet because we like kind of some of the principles behind it, but um, it just didn't stack up in the southeast. Yeah. In Leeds, the costing is so different. Yeah. We, we, were, we were sad by the fact that we got to the end of the project and we didn't have this solution for how to make projects affordable, not, not or at least a one-size-fits-all solution. Of course, there are bespoke solutions that will depend on the, the project itself. But, um, yeah, it's a real challenge, especially here. Thank you. All right, thank you. We've already said in other workshops that... Um, to promote the self-build register, and actually Liz mentioned it earlier. Um, the more people we get on that, I don't know how if anyone's still in this room and hasn't registered yet Shame for it. Um, <laughs> but please, if you haven't, can you do that as soon as possible? It's not that difficult. I did it the other day, and it's, it's fine actually. Just we send an email, basically. Um, so please do that, even if you know you're not actually thinking at the moment that you might do it. I don't know, but anyway, just just do it, please. Um, and also, similarly, uh, membership of the CLT, I believe everyone should, have, should be a member now, the, the CLT, if they're in this room. If you're not, join it very soon. <laughs>